for this week as we continue looking at some great news. And let's face it, we could always use some great news. <laughs> and we've had some good stuff so far, but today is kind of important. Because where did we learn that God is in control? Where did we learn that God is good? Where do we learn that God loves us? Where, do we, where did we learn all these things about this great news? Where do we find this great news? In God's what? Word. word. I got some great news. God's word is truth. <laughs> and that's kind of important, isn't it? In a world where you click on something on the internet and what are the odds that it is true? You hear something on the news, and what are the odds that it's true? You talk to friends, what's the odds that what they're telling you is true? <laughs> less than 100%. Everybody agree on that? Less than 100%. So we got to be careful, don't we? But when it comes to God's word, we don't have to have that insecurity. We don't have to have that question because God's word is truth. And is that important? I want to think about this for a minute. Let's say you're stuck in a hole, all right? But I want everybody to picture yourself, you're stuck way down deep in a hole. You were out hiking around, and you slipped into this well, and you're stuck down there. Are you feeling good about yourself right now? You know, a little scary, a little sad. And you hear a voice, it's your friend. He says, hello down there, how you doing? He says, great, I'm safe. Send me something down that can help me get out of this well. And all of a sudden, you see this thing coming down, streaming down, and it's toilet paper. And he says, this is all I've got. That's all I had handy. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll roll it down to you. You grab onto it, and I'll pull you up. Is that going to work? Well, he says, well, it's five ply. I mean, no, you're not roughing it, right? Come on. And you roll it up real tight like a, like a rope, and it, I'm sure it will hold you. Is that true? No, it's not true at all. I don't care how much you try, it ain't going to hold you. He says, okay, let me go grab something else. And he goes back, and he comes back, and you see it coming down, and it's yarn. Like, hey, come on. He, he likes to knit. You got something wrong with that? He was making a sweater. So he's like bringing some yarn down. He said, this will hold you. Just hold on, wrap it around you, tie it on, and I will pull you up. Is it going to work? What's the truth? No. He says, oh, okay, I'll go get something else. So he comes, and all of a sudden, a rope comes down. Ah, uh, how many are excited now? I wrap that sucker around you. So this is going to work. Both of them believe this is going to work. And he pulls, and it's rotten. It's dry rotted and it just snaps like it's nothing and you're down there. Why am I telling this story? <laughs> because it doesn't matter what the other person thinks is true. It doesn't matter what you think is true. What matters? What's true? <laughs> By the way, they did go find a good rope and they did get him out. So don't worry about him. Don't, uh, don't, don't be scared about him. He's, he's okay. But uh, it just reminds us, it doesn't matter how much you believe something is true, how much they say it's true, it doesn't matter. There is a truth, isn't there? And the truth is, the rope that is a good rope will work, <laughs> right? And the truth here is God's word. No matter what other people say about it, no matter what people believe about it, no matter what you believe about it, the fact is God's word is what? Truth. Truth. God's word is truth. And is that good news? Yes. Because <laughs> in this world, when you're not sure what to do, you're not sure what to believe, you're not sure what to trust, you have something <laughs> you can go back to and you can study. And you also have the Holy Spirit who is in your life to help you understand his word. You have God himself, the author of all things, who wants you to understand his word and his truth. You have a source to go to. So therefore, we should what? Go. Go to his word knowing that it is truth. In fact, let's see what the Bible is not and what it is. Let's all go to 2 Peter chapter 1. Since this is a book, a letter written by Peter, you know this is early on in church history. And how many always find it fascinating when you find something in the Bible written, like we're talking first century, that is going to address something that's going to happen in the world, like in the 8th century, 15th century, <laughs> and even today. Watch what he says here. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Moreover, 
I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease. So this is, this is kind of his deathbed letter. <laughs> so he knows he's about to die. And he was. Uh, he was martyred. He knew he was about to die. He's writing this letter back to the people saying, hey, after I'm dead and gone, there's something you need to understand. <clears throat> to have these things always remembered, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we may know unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So he wants to make sure they understand all the things that Peter and Paul and John and the disciples and the apostles, all the things that they've been teaching them about Jesus Christ, what he did, the miracles he did, the things he said, the parables he told, all of that was what? True. They are not cunningly devised fables. Now, if I was writing that, I'd say they're not coming to vice of fables. I'm not that smart. <laughs> Nobody's that smart, right? To really be able to figure it all out and know all this truth and know all these things. They are not cunningly devised fables of men. How many are happy about that? It's not just some story that's made up, right? This is the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. This is not the world of Harry Potter. This is not the world. As, as nicely, as tightly as they are written, this is truth. This is history, isn't it? These things happen. Verse 19. When we also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the da day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And we have even more than the testimony of the disciples and the apostles and what they saw about Jesus Christ, because we also have what? The Old Testament. We also have the letters of Paul and the letters of John and the letters of Peter. We have this book of Jude, right? We have all of these other things, too. We have an entire book here. And what does he say about that? Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. So it's not just a cunningly devised story, a fable, a tale meant to give us good insights into life and how to live. This is truth. Right? And it also isn't just somebody's interpretation of the truth. What does he know is going to happen in the future? There's going to be people like Muhammad who's going to sit there and say what? I have my own personal interpretation of the truth. Follow me. And will people? Oh, yeah. There's going to be people like Joseph Smith who's going to come and say what? I have a fable. I have a story to tell. I have my own interpretation of what the truth of God is. Come and what? Follow me. And how many more have there been? One person's idea, one person's story says come and follow me. Is that what we have here? One person's story, one person's ideas, one person's interpretation of the truth? No. We have far more than that, don't we? We have Hundreds of people literally wrote the Bible, right? Consistent over centuries, not just one period of time, in one man's lifetime. And how did we get to it? Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It wasn't their idea to sit down and say, oh, I've got this great story to tell. How many have ever written a story, written a book, written a song? Written something? It just comes to, it's inspired. It's like, oh, yeah, this is great. But that's what? That's your own ideas, right? not the way it worked. But they came what? But holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. This is the story of God. This is the history that God wants us to know. This is the instructions of who? God, right? This is whose interpretation of all the events of man? God's. And who's smarter than all of us? Hey, <laughs> so you okay with this? This is what God, of all the history, it always baffles me, of all the history of all the people in the world who have ever lived, of all the events of human history, of all the things written down as far as instructions for mankind and letters written and ideas written down, this, you can hold it in your hand, 
you can read it. You can read all of it. It's all there. He says, this is the important stuff. This is what you need to know from history. And here is what the instructions you need. How many find that awesome? Wouldn't it have been funny if he said, okay, I'm going to tell you much more of the story, and it's in a 36 volume. <laughs> Take up a whole bookshelf. <laughs> you know, and that, that's too much for us. But this is everything we need. How awesome is God? And he gives us this. We need to understand the Bible is not fables and ideas of mankind. It is what? The word of God. Therefore, it is what? Truth. Truth. If it was one man's interpretation, ten men's interpretation, a hundred men's interpretation, if it was any of this was a man's ideas, could we sit there and say, I'm not so sure about that? Yeah. Because what do all men have in common? And women, too. Come on, let's not be sexist here. <laughs> What, what do all of us have in common? Yeah, we're sinners, <laughs> right? With a reprobate mind that doesn't understand and does not know and does not get it. That's why it required who? The Holy Spirit to come down and give us this word of God that we may know what God says to us is what? Truth. In fact, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Another part of our response of reading today. Anybody ever been in Awanas? <laughs> so, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of truth. What is he talking about there? The Bible. The word of God is truth. So can you trust it? Yeah. If you need to know the truth, where can you go? Go to his word. Go to God. He will show you. He will tell you the truth. And how important is that? What that means for us is that the word of God is two very important things. We're in 2 Timothy, so just run over to chapter 3, verse 16. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, a young pastor. And he wants to make sure he understands that when he sticks to the word of God, when he teaches the word of God, that is, that is over and over again in his first and second letter to Timothy. Preach the word. Preach the gospel. Preach the truth. Preach that only. A lot of lies out there. Don't worry about those. Teach the what? Truth. And how can we know the truth? All scripture. How much of this? All. Even the stuff that's weird and we don't really understand? Yeah, even the stuff we don't like. Yes. Yeah. But you think about it for a minute. How horrible would that be if God said, 90% of this is true? What would be the fight over? Which 10% is right for you and which is right for me, right? <laughs> which 10% is right and which one is wrong, right? No, 100%. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, just as Peter said, right? People moved by the Holy Spirit wrote these things down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? What's that word there? <gasps> profitable. How many did something this week that wasn't very profitable? <laughs> Didn't really add to your life. Really not going to add much down the road. Didn't really. Know. Reading the word of God is not one of those. Studying the word of God is not one of those. When you study the word of God, it is profitable. It adds and gives benefit to your life. So come to church today, you are giving benefit to your life if you will hear his word today. Mm -hmm. How many could use a little profit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is profitable. Profitable for what? Well, he says. For doctrine. For teaching the truth about life about God, about sin, about us, about the future, about judgment, about eternity, about doctrine of who he is, who we are, and why we need him. The doctrine. It's good for doctrine. You want to know the truth? Where do you go? Right here. You want to know who God is? Where do you go? Here. Want to know who you are? Go where? Here. You don't want to know how to be saved? Where do you go? Here. If you go anywhere else, it's not the word of God. May not be the truth, right? It is good for doctrine. It is good for reproof. Reproof just means to tell you when you are wrong. Can we use that sometimes? Yeah. 
And sometimes we go down these roads in our life and we're doing the things and it isn't until we get way down the path we realize we made a wrong turn. <laughs> you know who tells us we're in a wrong turn? Word of God. You know when he starts tapping you on the shoulder? As soon as you make it. <laughs> as soon as you make that wrong turn, he's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you got to turn around, buddy. <laughs> you got you to get back on the right path. You got to get back. Gotta get back. It's good for that. We need that. We, don't sit there and say we're making good time. You're on the wrong way, right? <laughs> get back on the right path. It will tell us when we're going the wrong direction. It will tell us when we're doing the wrong thing. But it will also, what's the next one? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. How many have ever had a boss that just said, that was wrong? Do it again. He brought it back and said, that was wrong. Do it again. That was wrong. I had a teacher like that once. It drove me crazy. So that's wrong. Do it again. They're giving me reproof. What are they not giving me? Correction. Correction. <laughs> it's like, well, what's wrong about it? What am I supposed to do? I want to do the right thing, right? Aren't you glad that God does that? He'll tell you that's wrong, but also tell you what? This is right. This is how to correct it. This is how to get back on that right path again. And also for what? Instruction in righteousness. How can I live a life pleasing to God, my Creator, my Savior, my God? How can we do the right things? It is an instruction. I know a lot of us don't like to follow instructions. I don't think I've ever followed the entire IKEA instruction manual all the way through. How many ever get to the point and say, I got it, oh, I got it now? <laughs> yeah. All right, I, I get where they're going, right? I can, get it. I can get it from here. What invariably happens? I got to unscrew something because I put it in before I need to do that one and then I mess it all up. Life's the same way. This is our instruction manual. We got to we gotta look at it. <laughs> Where am I supposed to be going? What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I wrong? Where am I right? What about you? What about me? All of it is where? Here in this very handy, easy to read <laughs> book. And you know what? The teacher's there the whole time saying, I'll help you understand it, too. Holy Spirit's inside us to constantly tell us what we need to know. That is the truth. It is a book which is the truth. Therefore, it is profitable. And it is also, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. I go right through Hebrews and James. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And basically what he's saying there, it is what you what? It's what you need. What does a baby need? Sleep, milk, poop. That's it. It's just <laughs> that's their entire existence. So, and a third of that is what? Eating. And how much do they want food when they want food? It's everything. <laughs> There's nothing. There's nothing else you can do. You can't distract them. You can't give them something else. You can't just say, take a nap. You can't just say, here, look at this shiny thing. When they are hungry, they want what? Food. When we need the word of God, what should our response be? We need the word of God. We desire it like a newborn babe desires milk because it is what we need to grow. It is what we need to succeed. It is what we need to move ahead. It is what we need to get closer to God. It is what we need. So, your assignment is, you can't eat until you read your Bible. No, just kidding. <laughs> How many of you read their Bible more? <laughs> I would eat it. I would be reading it all the time. <laughs> I'm a snacker. <laughs> all right? So, yeah. When we're, when we're hungry, we eat. When we're thirsty, we what? Drink. When we li live and breathe, we should desire what? The Word of God. Because it is what we need. Bottom line here. Let's go to John 6, 68. Just a little setup here. John 6 has a chapter with the feeding of the 5,000. What were the people? Hungry. As newborn babes, they were starving, right? And what did they need? They needed food. Did God give them food? 
Yeah, even though they had only five loaves and two little dried fishes, that was that enough to feed 5,000 men plus women and children? Yes, because God can do anything, right? Nothing's beyond his reach. Jesus Christ, our God, made the food for everybody. There's 12 baskets left over for the disciples, each to take their food. This is also after then that night he went up to pray. Disciples went across the sea, got into a big storm, and Jesus, what, walked on the water out to them, right? Okay. After all of that, the next morning, what were the people? Hungry. hungry. <laughs> I mean, you're hungry in the morning. I, I mean, you just fasted for an entire eight hours. Come on. When any hour without food, I'm starving. So who do they look for? Did they seek Jesus because they saw the miracle and said, ah, that's God. I want to be close to him. <laughs> I, I want to know him. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. I want to serve him. I want to love him. I want to know. No. Where's the guy with the food? They didn't see him where they were at, so they actually went across and caught him on the other side and tracked him down into the synagogue. And they're all standing out there waiting for him to give them food. And what does he give them? A lesson. You only seek me because I fed you. You need to seek me because I have life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Come follow me and... They said what? No. <laughs> you're not giving us food? You're not going to heal us anymore? You're not going to do you're not going to take care of our problems? You're not going to kick out the Romans? You're not you're not going to meet our physical needs? No, we have no need of you then. And they left. The way it reads is like they all left, except his twelve disciples. John chapter six. We'll actually start in verse sixty seven. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you go away? Are you also going to just walk away? And what does Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, say? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. God's word is truth. God's word is what? Life. It's eternal life, but it is also life where? You want to make a difference in this life. You want to have peace and joy and hope and love in this life. You want to live a life that God has for you in this life. You find it where? In his word. Right? It is life now, life abundant now, and it is eternal life. That's the word of God. How many love the word of God? <laughs> it's such an amazing thing. Keep studying. Keep getting into it. I always guarantee the kids. If you just started now and did nothing but just keep studying the Word of God your whole life, just constantly studying, going to church, going to, I guarantee you by the time you're 90, you will still say, I don't even understand it even a little. <laughs> There's so much in here, and you just keep getting more and more. Don't be afraid of running out. Keep studying the Word of God. Keep loving the Word of God. In fact, what should we do knowing that God's Word is truth? First off, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. We're in John. Let's run back to Matthew real quick. After Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, telling them all about how they lack righteousness, they need salvation, they need to choose that one narrow path that leads to salvation, not that broad path that leads to destruction. That there's going to be many people who are going to come and lie to them about these things, but he has the truth. He finishes up the Sermon on the Mount with this, starting in verse 24 of Matthew 7. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, hears the word of God and does them, I will liken him to a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Knowing that God's word is truth, we need to listen to it, we need to do it in our life, and if we do that, it will be a what? A solid foundation. Will the storms come? Will doubts come? Will questions come? Will persecution come? Will, will troubles come? Yes, they will come, but if your foundation is the truth of God, when the storms are over, you will stand what? Firm. Because it doesn't shift. He goes on to the other guy who's not a wise person. The foolish man built his house on what? The sand. 
And when the storms come and the doubts come, what happens to sand when the storms come? Yeah, you go this way, that way. Yeah. Put your faith in a man. Put your faith in a woman. Put your faith in a government. Put your faith in a political party. Put your faith <laughs> in anything else other than the truth of the word of God, and it's going to be like what? Shifting sand. And what happens to that life? It comes crashing down. Storms come to both, don't they? Troubles come to all life, don't they? The question is, are you founded on the foundation of the Word of God, or are you relying on your own understanding, your own ideas, mankind's ideas, philosophies? Which is it going to be? Truth of the Word of God lays a fantastic foundation. Also, we need to let, let it take root in our life. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 3. And Jesus is going to speak a parable. And parables were always meant to be something that people would understand. They were a farming community, right? He liked to do sheep. He liked to do farming. He liked to do those kinds of things. That's who they were. They understood this. And we can too. Chapter 13, verse 3. And Jesus spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now put the seed out into that broken ground so that he can have a great crop. Verse 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some on the pathway, where it was kind of stamped down and hard, it's not going to get down the ground, is it? And what happens to seed on the ground? It is immediately snapped up by birds, right? That's just the way life is. Try it sometime. Or a squirrel. One or the other. Verse 5. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprang up because they had no deepness of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. Some may say, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Look at these wonderful words of Jesus. Look at this wonderful truth here. That's fantastic. But there's no depth. There's no desire to actually do it, no, to actually make it part of their life. So it may spring up, but what happens when questions come or persecution or any doubts? What does it do? It just withers, right? It just withers away. How much fruit has he gotten so far out of these seeds? Nothing. Third seeds, verse 7. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. So they did spring up. They maybe even produced a little bit of fruit, maybe, but... Things of the world, desires of the world, worries of the world, fears of the world, all just made them unproductive. And he didn't get much out of that. So what do we need to be? Anybody want to be one of those three? I don't want to be those three. I want to be this one. Verse 8, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear? Let him what? Hear. We need to let the Word of God, when we come together on Sunday and I preach the Word of God, and I will always preach the Word of God, I will always read from the Word of God, I will always give you the verses so you can read it too, because that's how important it is, right? I'm not here to tell you what the Word of God is, I'm not here to just tell you what it says. Okay? And what does the Word of God say? You need to take that Word of God and you need to make it part of your life. Dig it down deep, let it get deep into your life. Make it a part of your life, and if it does that, it will produce what? Fruit. Now, always the same amount? No, some 30, some 60, some 100. But will it produce fruit, and will the Lord, the Master, be happy? Yes. If we let it get in our life. And then we need to what? Hold it firmly. Let's go to 119. Psalm 119. If you have a little time this week, sit down and just read Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is a love letter to the Word of God. It's uh, written in a giant poem. Uh, each little stanza is eight verses. Each little stanza, you'll notice, starts with a little letter at the top. That's the Hebrew alphabet. And it goes through the Hebrew alphabet. And in Hebrew, the first word of each stanza starts with that letter of the Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> so somebody took some time on this one. <laughs> they put some effort into this one to make sure everybody understand how wonderful the word of God is. And in fact, look how he starts it here in Psalm 119. Let's go to verse 9. 
Wherewithal, how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought you. O oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right? We sang that a little earlier. But it's true. The word of God is so important, we need to make sure we bring it into our life and we hold it tight. We get it way down into our heart. We make it our heart's desire to know and follow and love the word of God. That's how important it is. Because it makes such a great difference in our life. It does give hope and peace and love and joy. It gives all those things in our life, even in the difficult times. It gives us that thing, that firm foundation, that thing to hold on to. It is that important. Love the word of God. In fact, let's do a little demo. How can we hold on to it? We've done this before. Everybody grab. If you don't have a, a physical Bible next to you, just grab a hymnal or whatever. Everybody grab a book, okay? Uh, everybody grab a book, okay? I want everybody to grab that book with just their pinky. Go ahead. Come on. Get it on there. Everybody got it? Let me ask you something. How easy would it be to take that away from you? Super easy. <laughs> you don't have a firm grip on it at all, do you? No, no. That's like somebody who just hears the word of God. Because if you just hear the word of God, what's it easy to do? Right out. One ear and out the other. For some, it doesn't even hit anything in between, right? Just zips right through. Just hearing is not enough. Notice that Jesus said, he who hears these things and what does it will have the foundation, right? Just hearing it. Is it good to hear it? Yes. But that's not enough. So I want you to grab it with two fingers like that. Yeah. There you go. That's somebody who hears it, but then also reads it. You have further contact. Do you have a little better grip? How many would say you have a good grip? <laughs> Not a very good. Still very easy to grab it from you, right? So, but is that still better, right? You're hearing it. You're reading it yourself. So you know this isn't just somebody else's idea. You're seeing it for yourself. Now grab it with three fingers. Come on. You, you can get a good grip on that one. I, see, I can actually hold it up here. Like, yeah, that's decent, right? That's somebody who hears it, they read it, and then they study it. Who said this? <laughs> What's the context of this? What's going on here? Why is this important to me? Just getting a, you got a little better grip on it? A little bit I could take it from you. <laughs> Even you can do a little. I, I can still take that from you. I can. Three's not very good. How about four? Four fingers. Four, okay, that, that, that's a little better, right? That's somebody who hears it, but also reads it, and also studies to know a little more about what it's saying, and then also meditates on it. As you go through life, you're thinking about it. How does this apply to me? What should I be doing? Oh, what's the word of God say? Just putting a little more into it, right? Meditating on it. How many have an absolute great grip on it yet, though? It's good. But well, what makes us different than most of the animals? <laughs> how, how important is that guy? <laughs> how many love their thumbs? Okay. Thumbs are important because it allows you to what? You want a firm hold on to it. Hear it. Read it. Study it. Meditate it. Think about how it applies to your life, but then also do it. <laughs> Do it. When you do the word of God, do you then have a good grip on it? Then can it make a difference? Then is that lifeline? Kind of like that story at the very beginning. If you're down in the hole and they send a good rope down to you, how many of you would just hold on to it with one pinky? <laughs> Two? How many fingers would you put on that rope? Both hands. How many would tie it around you? How many would strap it around you so there's no way it could get loose? Because you don't want to fall out about halfway up, do you? That's what the Word of God. Get a hold of it. Make it part of your life. Get it down into you by what? Hearing it, yes. Reading it, yes. Studying it, meditating on it, and doing it. You make it part of your life. It has the ability to give you all those many blessings and to put you on that right path. Do you believe that? Yeah. Because the Word of God is what? truth. Know it. Study it. Let it be part of your life, because it is the truth that God has for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the